When Donald Trump first took office, he came into the White House like a wrecking ball, overturning dozens upon dozens of Obama-era policies. But one in particular has followed him for years, and this week all the way to France and the G7 summit, Trump's decision to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. Iran is no longer the same country it was as it was two and a half years ago. Yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll do our own outreach. But, you know, I can't stop people from talking. If they want to talk, they can talk. The people he's referring to, his fellow G7 leader, French President Emmanuel Macron, who invited Iran's foreign minister to the summit for talks after a series of international confrontations in the waters off Iran and increased nuclear activity in the country in response to U.S. sanctions, which Trump reinstated when he pulled out of the deal. The visit reportedly surprised President Trump, who says he still doesn't want to meet with Iran's President Hassan Rouhani, at least not yet. I think he's going to want to meet. I think Iran wants to get this situation straightened out. If the circumstances were correct or the right, I would certainly agree to that. But in the meantime, they have to be good players. Of course, President Rouhani says if the U.S. isn't going to uphold our end of the bargain, why should Iran? He also says he would only be willing to meet with Trump if Trump lifts the sanctions, which so far has been a non-starter in Washington. So is there any hope for an agreement? I'm joined now by a man who was there when the original deal was negotiated. Glenn Johnson was a top communications aide for Secretary of State John Kerry from 2013 to 2017. He writes about his time with the State Department in a new book titled Window Seat on the World. Glenn, good to see you. Adam, it's great to see you again. So my assumption is that if I asked you on Election Day in 2016 to tell me what uh, Secretary of State Kerry's legacy was, that the Iran deal would be at the top of the list. Am I right about that? Sure. I think by order of magnitude. Uh, there was other things. There was an agreement for a power-sharing arrangement in Afghanistan that stands to this day. Uh, there was work on climate change yep. that would put us in alignment with about 185 other countries. But the amount of time and effort that he put into the Iran deal at the behest of the president was because Iran getting a nuclear weapon would be so destabilized in an already fractured part of the world. And so trying to take that possibility off the table and all the spin-off effects that that would have was probably one of the most important things he did while he was Secretary of State. You describe in the book in, in some detail just how intense those negotiations mm -hmm. got. And I think some of this stuff maybe has been reported previously. Some of it hasn't. But can you just paint a picture of how heated the atmosphere could get in those talks? Sure. Well, first of all, this was a multinational negotiation. Everybody sort of posits it as the U.S. and Iran making a deal. The Secretary of State in the U.S. was sort of the, the sheep herders <laughs> for the permanent members of the U.N. Security Council and the 28-member 20, uh, European Union. So you had this broad and diverse constituency that the Secretary had to try and shepherd into a deal while also trying to hold faith with what President Obama wanted to achieve. Now, but at many points, it, became down, it came down to just a direct negotiation between him and the foreign minister of Iran, Javad Zarif. And at times, that got very heated. Is it, is it in one of those meetings where you describe Kerry throwing a pen down on the desk in anger, right? And yeah. didn't it ricochet? And it, did it hit Zarif? No, it hit one of the p members of his delegation. Okay. And at another time, one of our aides had to go in and tell them. We could hear them screaming from the next room over. And, uh, and he said, listen, everybody can hear the yelling that's going on in this room. And when that story later came out from the Iranian perspective, it was that Zarif had really gotten in Kerry's oh, face yeah, and, yeah. and had to be restrained. So, yeah, there was a lot of histrionics on both sides and, and, and a lot of spin as to what was really going on. So that's a huge part of the Kerry legacy, or was a huge part of the Kerry legacy. We'll get to the, the present moment in just sure. a second. But uh, Jason Rezaian, the mm -hmm. secretary, was able to help secure his release. That was it, It's not the Iran nuclear deal, but it's similar in that it involves Iran. That was a big deal. Yeah, it was a big deal. And... You know, people will deny there was linkage, but there was sort of a concurrent operation there. Uh, President Obama wanted to clean up a lot of things that were interconnected, and the Iranians did too. And one of them was this deal where Iran was owed money for F-14 and other fighters that it had bought way back when the uh, Islamic Revolution occurred, uh, and that money had been held in escrow for years. 
the U.S. wanted to get back Jason Rezaian. You can remember there was a huge movement like there is today still for Austin Tice and others to try and get Jason Rezaian out. And so in one fell swoop, the deal was made and the Rezaian negotiation was, was completed and the Hague deal was, was done. And, uh, you know, I remember the secretary vividly signing the sanctions relief for Iran to get relief from the U.S. and other imposed sanctions. And at the same time, Jason Rezaian was moving to the airport to fly back home. Uh, you mentioned the Paris Climate Agreement. And I'm going to rush through that because mm -hmm. I, I want to get to the here and now and maybe accentuate the negative instead of the positive. But the Paris Climate Agreement, of course, as, as you know better than me, as our viewers will remember, was this big deal. It was heralded as sort of the world finally acting in concert with the uh, decisiveness that it had to act to confront this existential threat. But as you know, again, much better than me, um, since President Trump took office, he has been engaged in systematically rolling back so many of the things that Secretary Kerry worked on, that you worked on, that President mm -hmm. Obama worked on. And But before I get your reaction to that, I want to just roll a clip of a, a speech from Senator Kerry that you, or Secretary Kerry, that you quote early in the book. Let's take a look at what Secretary Kerry had to say when he greeted State Department staff early in his tenure. We get to try to make peace in the world. We get to lift people out of poverty. We get to speak to those who have no voice. We get to talk about empowering people through our ideals and through those ideals hopefully they can change their lives. What struck me about that is that that seems antithetical to the way the Trump administration views U.S. foreign power mm -hmm. uh, or you know, foreign relations. So you have the, the premises changing the Trump administration pulling out of the Iran deal, the Trump administration pulling out of Paris. What's it been like to watch so many things that you and the secretary worked hard on go up in smoke? Well, somebody once asked me, how do you feel personally about it? And I don't think anybody cares how I f personally feel I about kinda it. I kind of do. But, <laughs> but I, what I feel more is, is uh, frustration, not so much because there was a change in policy. There's a new administration. They may have a different perspective on things. But some of these policies and, and agreements have been abandoned for what? You know, you walked away from an Iran nuclear deal that, that not just had the, the consensus. When has the UN Security Council and the European Union ever agreed unanimously on anything? Most often the stories are about the China or Russia or the United States vetoing each other's resolutions. Yeah. Here they were all in concert in agreeing that this was a, a deal to be made with Iran. You had this huge international coalition saying, finally, and based on the travel that we did around the world, this is an existential threat. We saw everything from the North Pole, where there's already receding glaciers glaciers and bays that are no yeah. longer frozen to the south where there's just huge climate change already going on underway. This is a real clear and present danger to the world and you have the Trump administration walk away for it. Again, for what? So they've done very well at pulling back or dismantling initiatives of the Obama administration, but they haven't gotten anything yet on Iran. They haven't gotten anything yet on North Korea. They haven't gotten anything yet on climate. They haven't gotten anything yet in a lot of other places with China, etc. And so they've created and they've, they've re, re, you know, rescinded a lot of things, but they haven't put anything in their place. Did it surprise you that they took that tack? I mean, I, I think of that meeting that President Trump had with uh, President Obama, where mm -hmm. Trump talked about what great chemistry they'd had, and they'd, mm -hmm. ne you know, they'd never even met, despite all the years that President Trump was questioning whether President Obama was really born in the U.S. Um, <laughs> so, so that, I think, you know, that meeting gave some people uh, some hope that there'd be a measure of continuity. Were you surprised that it, it ended up being a just let's roll back everything, or did you get cues as you were leaving the State Department, that that was the tack they were going to take? Sure. I mean, I could see it coming. Uh, we, you know, the election happened, I think, November 6th or 8th. Uh, a short time later, we got an email from Dennis McDonough telling everybody that you had to submit a resignation effective uh, at the end, of, by December 6th, effective at the end of the term. We got a note from everybody in the State Department, for everybody in the State Department, saying we have to uh, participate in an orderly transition. This is a duly elected president. He's bringing in his own team. We had a whole wing of transition offices set up on the first floor of the State Department. Secretary Kerry reached out to then uh, Secretary of State designate Rex Tillerson three different times for meetings. All of it was rebuffed. There was no handoff between the Secretary of State mm -hmm. outgoing and the Secretary of State incoming. It's highly unusual, right? 
I mean, these are national security jobs. And the thing that most concerned me, I left the office 20 minutes before Donald Trump was sworn in and President Obama's term ended and my presidential appointment ended. I handed in my BlackBerry at the State Department IT office. And when I got in that cab driving away from the State Department, I had a chill up my spine because I had come to appreciate how important these national security jobs were. And there had been zero handoff. And so if something had happened at that point with North Korea or some other place, Russia trying to take advantage of this ch changeover in power, I just didn't feel like there had been any sort of orderly transition between two administrations or a handoff of, uh, of intel, so to speak, yeah. about how to handle them. And that was not good for our country. Really briefly, huge question. I think we have maybe 30 seconds. Do you see any hope that, that Trump's, uh, what was Henry Kissinger's phrase, the sort of madman style of negotiating, mm -hmm. you know, saying one thing, then saying the opposite? Any hopefulness on your part that that could end up yielding fruit with Iran or in any uh, other areas? North Korea, most hopefully. President Obama told him that was the number one national security threat he faced. When we heard fire and fury and all these things, everybody sort of raised their yeah. eyebrows. Where are we going with this? But he has gotten him to the table. But again, like many other th things, he's not gotten anything done yet. All right. Glenn Johnson, thank you. I wish we had 20 more minutes. <laughs> Congrats on the book. It's fascinating. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate it. The book, again, is Window Seat on the World, My Travels with the Secretary of State.